Hello, my name is Nikolai Yusupov. I'm a certified critical care paramedic in New York City. And in this video, I'd like to show you the tools that I use with me on different types of jobs. Some of them I carry on my person, and some of them I have in my bag and have access to them whenever I need them. Uh, here, I'm gonna show you exactly uh, for what reason I use them. And you may implement them in your practice as you see so fit. So we will begin this with a Sharpie marker. This is an industrial style Sharpie marker, I picked this up on sale. This one writes on all types of surfaces. It's used in labs, it's heat resistant, and uh, I like it and it works pretty well. I used this one prior to buying this box. Uh, this one has a retractable tip, so if you're a person who loses the caps easily, you may want to get this one. Uh, this here is a surgical pad. Uh, it's used by surgeons uh, whenever they do suturing or they want to just de demarcate the area. Um, for further analysis or so forth. So this is used on to marking uh, uh, the skin. So I got this in the hospital. So what is the reason you will implement a Sharpie marker? So if you have a patient who has multiple infusions, let's say he has three infusions going at the same time, you wanna mark them uh, so you know which uh, line has which medication. And in case you need to troubleshoot it, in case you need to push medications through it and you need to know if they're compatible with that medication, so what you're gonna do is you will have your IV set, administration set connected to the medication. So here's the IV set. You'll take a piece of tape like so. And I like to put it uh, over here uh, above where you're gonna push a medication if you need to push one. This way it's easier for you to grab the line and know exactly what it is and know if this line will be compatible uh, with the drug you're about to push or not. Usually you want to push drugs in line that don't have any drugs going in it, like normal saline fluids. All right, so you'll put a piece of tape like so. All right, so if I had a patient who was getting, let's say, uh, norepinephrine for his hemodynamics, he was getting fentanyl for his sedation, and let's say normal saline uh, for his fluid needs, you will label each one, um, you know, norepi, fentanyl, and... Um, normal saline uh, per respectable uh, line. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna place a piece of tape like so. You're gonna take a Sharpie marker and let's say if this was the Norepi uh, line, here I would write Norepi. Okay, like so. And you will do this for every line that you will have. This way, whenever you're packaging the patient and everything is bundled up in sheets and so forth, and let's say your pump malfunctions or there's deterioration, whenever you go searching for it, you open up and right away you grab the line and you know exactly what it is. And if the patient were to go in cardiac arrest and you need to push your ACLS medication, uh, let's say this was normal saline, you quickly found the line, pinch off here, and you push your medications as you see so uh, as needed. So. This is, this is for your uh, IV lines, right? I also like to mark the cassettes on my uh, Laris pump. It fits to our pump. And here I would also write the same thing. I would write Norepi. Right? So I know, and this, let's say if this is uh, applicable to channel A, I'll put channel A here, or B or whatever it may be. So you know exactly that this medication uh, is no rapi and there's no issues, there's no confusion. Now, if you elected to use syringes uh, to withdraw medication, uh, you know, prior to putting them on the pump, so let's say you have a bag hanging in the hospital and you came in and you withdrew using a 60C syringe to put on your uh, uh, pump. So what I would do is prior to you withdrawing the medication, I would take the syringe, I'll come over to the drug, uh, so identify the drug. I like to put this tape, not on the marking where I have my ML markings, I like to put it somewhere where there's nothing, right? So I'll put a piece of tape like so. And let's say if this was the same medication, let's say this was Norepi, Norepi gone, and I would write exactly on this, the name of the medication. I'll write the dose. So let's say if this was going at 0.5 micrograms, 
per kilogram per minute. Right? This way it's labeled, and when you come to withdraw it from the bag, everything is good to go. So you'll turn it this way, and you fill up the required amount, and then you'll put them on your, uh, you put your half set here, and I'll label the half set as well as I showed you prior to it. So use the Sharpie marker to label your uh, IV lines, to label your syringes. Next thing here uh, I have is uh, a Leatherman, uh, Juice S2. All right, let's see if it will focus. Yes. So I don't like big bulky uh, tools. I don't like to have like a eight inch knife or like big pliers and so forth because the bulk scares weighs you down. We already have a lot of stuff that we have on us. So the utility of these things is you have pliers, right? You have small scissors here on the outside. You have knife and you have your scissors so scissors could be used to cut uh, whatever we need tape uh, you know trim your EKGs um, you know if you need to, to cut clothing this will work pretty well you have your knife for uh, cutting packages or whatever else that needs to cut uh, the pliers I used for sometimes uh, when we do an isolate job, uh, they want to switch their tanks, but their uh, medical air or two may be connected to a high 50 psi tank, and uh, it's bolted so tight that you cannot unscrew it with your hand. And sometimes they don't carry the the required tools, so this tool was used a lot of times to exchange those tanks. Uh, I also use this sometimes. You come in the hospital, and uh, they're connected. Uh, medications will be so tight that you cannot really get them out with your hand what you can do is if you take a you know a four by four here this is what i'm talking about so if if they're connected so tightly here right that you cannot take it out out of your hand what you can do is you could take a four by four like so right and you have to be very very gentle here you'll put a four by four here take the pliers here right and be very gentle and it will come out okay so this is your multi-tool this is Leatherman Juice S2 you could use any other ones I like it because it's small fits in your pocket doesn't weigh you down okay uh, next thing here is um, I have this uh, tool it's called TK1 it's a uh, O2 range. I'll insert a video on uh, with the oxygen tank itself with the cylinder um, and uh, this part here um, will open up the tank, close the tank, but this part here if you have a regulator um, and uh, it's not tight fitting you could really crank it down with this part on the regulator. The regulator is uh, loose like this part here. Right. This thing connects on this side and you really yank it down and crank it down and also if, if it was manually operated you have a key to turn this way you place it this way uh, so it's really convenient all right next stop is um, I always have my phone uh, I I have all my apps for uh, medication to look up Hippocrates uh, I have my different charts, PDFs that I made over the years, and I'm sure you guys have your own apps that you like. Um, it's also very convenient to have on you. Okay. Uh, certainly, you'll have a you know watch. I'm not going to spend too much time discussing it. Um, you know, to for your vital signs, uh, to check pulse, respiratory rate, and so forth. Uh, the next thing I want to show you is this device here. It's called the peep, peep valve. And you could obtain this from any respiratory therapist inside a hospital. Uh, if you come to them and say, can I have a peep valve or do you have a peep valve? Most will give you one. Uh, this thing dials from 5 to 20 centimeters of water of peep. Let me bring it closer so you could see if it will focus. So at the top is 5 and all the way here is 20. And how much... 
you crank it down will depend on how much water pressure you're giving so here uh, it's 15 and here if you go all the way down cranking down it's 20 so what's the utility of a p-pop what's the big deal right so if you have a standard bvm like so right this is your standard bvm back valve mask uh, now if if you are you know doing critical care transport and you have a patient who has ARDS or any other type of uh, problem that they require high peeps you're obviously going to take a BVM in case you have ventilator malfunctions breaks or whatever right but if they're on such a high amounts of peep uh, you bagging them with this bag through the endotracheal tube or uh, tracheostomy or whatever they have going right now without a peep valve will do absolutely nothing their alveoli will collapse and the patients will not be oxygenated however if this peep valve is placed here right like so and dialed in appropriately to whatever patient settings uh, that the peep was so let's say if your ventilator was on uh, peep of 15 and this was keeping the patient's uh, oxygenation at the correct range at the proper SpO2 and your ventilator were to malfunction. Uh, this device will basically save the patient until you get to, you know, uh, the facility that has a functioning ventilator. So if you have a patient who has high amounts of PEEP, you want to get a PEEP valve set it to whatever PEEP they're going and have this connected to your two tank nearby in case of malfunctions. The other thing is, uh, this device turns a BVM uh, if you were to use this on a patient and you place this on your patient's face like so right and you wanted to pre the patient and denitrogenate the patient uh, prior to intubation if you place this over this over his face and the patient was spontaneously breathing you would have to squeeze the bag every single time for patient to receive oxygen because uh, the way this uh, uh, BVM works is it will not let patient take his own breaths out of the bag you have to squeeze physically squeeze the bag for patients to get anything but if you have this device and and you place this over the patient's face and they're spontaneously breathing they're able to uh, take um, the oxygen the high FiO2 that is connected to the bag and be able to oxygenate themselves and to denitrogenate de themselves with this device in place. In addition, if you do not have a CPAP uh, device uh, available, this thing could be used as a CPAP because every time the patient has to exhale, they have to exhale against this PEEP that is set on this PEEP valve. So if you had a patient who required CPAP therapy and uh, you didn't have CPAP or your CPAP were to malfunction. Again, you set this at the whatever uh, uh, PEEP the patient required. CPAP is synonymous with PEEP. So you will set it at wherever it was. You will apply this to the patient's face. And whenever they exhale, they would have to generate this much uh, positive and expiratory pressure uh, for them to uh, exhale. And this will create a PEEP they require. So always have this device. It's small, convenient. You could get from any respiratory therapist. Uh, this device here, it's called uh, bougie introducer. Uh, some sometimes it's called gum elastic bougie. Uh, at times it's called endotracheal tube introducer. Right? This is how it looks. It looks like a blue stylet. It's not hollow. Right? It's long. Right? You could get this from uh, people who actually know about this stuff. So it's probably going to be either anest anesthesia people or emergency room physicians. So ask an uh, anesthesiologist or emergency room physician for a gum bougie or uh, a, just just a bougie or and the tracheal tube introducer. So the way this works, this is like a rescue device. And if you have a patient who has a difficult airway and you open his airway with a laryngoscope and you barely could see the cords, all you could see is the posterior notch, right? And just a glimpse of the cords. Uh, you know that the endotracheal tube will not really go in. It will be obstructed. However, if you see the posterior notch, you could insert this device, uh, angle it like so, and get it through the notch. If, if this goes into the trachea, the tracheal rings, uh, whenever it passes them, it will bump on every single tracheal ring in order to go in. So you will feel it uh, and you will hear it. 
so you'll feel every ring it will be like trr, 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 to, to pass through it and uh, if once it comes to the carina it will most likely stop so it, you will hear the tracheal rings you will feel them and this will not advance further however if you were in a esophagus you will not feel the tracheal rings and the esophagus obviously and this will think this thing will advance all the way down to the stomach so you know you're in the wrong location so this is a rescue device and once you pass it through the posterior notch and you're in the cords what you will do is you will hold this device there uh, the, you will still hold the laryngoscope blade open uh, with the tongue displaced and your partner will feed the endotracheal tube like so he will feed it over the top of the stylet so the endotracheal tube will be fed through here while we're still holding it in the patient's mouth, uh, more, more specifically in the trachea, and you will advance it like so, and you will advance it past the vocal cords into the trachea. So this device here is for your difficult intubations who do not have a good visual uh, of the airway. So Gambuji or endotracheal tube introducer. Right. Uh, next thing is obviously a stethoscope. You want to have your stethoscope for your uh, heart sounds, for your respiratory sounds, confirm your endotracheal tubes. Uh, you want to check your blood pressures, your abdominal uh, sounds, epigastric sounds, and so forth. So, this is a cardiology grade stethoscope. And um, what you want to have for a good stethoscope, you want to have a piece, it's called a diaphragm. This is for your high pitched sounds such as your uh, lung sounds, right? And you want to have your bell. Bell is for your low pitch sounds, and this part here is for your blood pressure auscultation and for your cardiac sounds, right? So you want to hear uh, uh, both of these things whenever you have a patient. Um, if, you're, if you have an untrained ear and uh, you, know, you don't know what the heart sounds are, whenever you do critical care transport, a lot of times you will have an echocardiography report and it will say, patient has a systolic murmur, um, he will have, you know, gallop or so forth. So look what it says and then go and listen and try to associate that sound with uh, what's written. Uh, echo will show you the, definitively what the problem is. So by auscultating, you'll know what the sound uh, is. And there's, um, you could find a diagram for your cardiac sounds uh, online, just type in auscultation of cardiac sounds and I'll try to put a link in this so you know which locations to uh, auscultate for your cardiac sounds. So standard stethoscope, it doesn't matter uh, which one you have, it doesn't matter the brand name, but try to get the one that has both the diaphragm and a bell. All right. All right. Next up is have a temporal and oral uh, thermometer. Uh, this is how it looks, right? This thing here uh, is mostly for whenever you're going to a nursing facility um, and you have a patient who doesn't look well, you know, you're obviously going to check his respiratory rate, his uh, blood pressure, his heart rate, and so forth. But there's something called SIRS uh, criteria to identify patients who may be susceptible to or are in septic shock. Thus, if you have your thermometer, uh, you could have objective data. So whenever you have a patient from skilled nursing facility who appears to be altered mental status and you've done your physical exam and so forth and whenever you come to the uh, facility wherever you call your notification and you find the attending physician you could clearly tell them you know this patient was a skilled nursing home patient he's altered mental status his temperature right now was 39.8 his heart rate is 105 uh, you know his respiratory rate is 22 uh, you know, his anti idle CO2 is uh, 28 and so forth. So this will be your uh, objective data that why they should start early goal directed therapy and why you call notification uh, for this patient. So you can find this in a hospital and I like to have this on person with me whenever I go to a nursing facility. Uh, next up is you always want to have a piece of tape with you to secure your, um, you know, anything that you may have to label your lines to label your syringes. I always have a thicker pieces with me as well if you need to secure your IV pump to the stretcher. Uh, another thing I like to have with me is a carabiner, like so. Uh, carabiner, uh, you could hook this up in the back of your stretcher and it could hold IV uh, bags like so. 
and you can hang it in the back of your stretcher if you have multiple drips going at the same time you could uh, put it uh, this will hang on the back of your stretcher until you get into the ambulance and you could hang them in the ambulance so this is the carabiner uh, another thing I like to carry is uh, a pulse oximetry this is a neonatal pulse oximetry you could use it on neonates but at times you have a patients in the ICU and they have really poor perfusion to their distal extremities and you may have no readings on your monitor. So what you can do is take this neonatal because it's uh, flexible, you could tape it around their ear lobe uh, and maybe you'll get a reading. So always have one of these in case the facility does not. Um, uh, another thing that uh, you may find useful, this is a, uh, looks like an alcohol pad, but this is actually a nail polish remover. Um, this is more applicable if you're doing scene response and on one calls. If a patient has thick nails with nail polish and your pulse oximetry is not giving you a reading, you could use this for removing the nail polish. You also could get this in the hospital. Um, this here is a device made by uh, Dynarax. It's a compact razor, right? This is how it deploys here from the package. Right. So whenever you have a patient who has a lot of chest hair, uh, if you were to do a 12 EVKG, you know, your electrodes will not stick. You'll have a lot of artifact and you'll not have a diagnostic 12 EKG. So um, our company has this in uh, the life pack 12s that we carry, but you can buy these and put them in your pocket. Uh, if you need to do a 12 EVKG or apply paddles and the patient has a lot of chest hair uh, to get good connection on the, you know, on the electrodes. Uh, also have um, you know alcohol preps with me. Uh, this here is whenever you do skin prep uh, for the 12 EVKG, this will work very well. Um, you know, remove the dead skin cells. Uh, if you need to start your IV and so forth, and um, you know you have uh, extra ones in your pocket. Uh, every time that whenever you switch your IV uh, administration set and you disconnect it from the patient, or you connect it. Uh, disconnect from the IV line and you connect it to your half set you always want to clear the ends and you want to clear with alcohol to make sure the patient uh, doesn't get anything because this these things uh, may go in his uh, central line and uh, central line goes directly into central circulation so you want to wear a mask you want to have um, everything to be you know as sterile as possible so if you disconnected this from the hospital and you were to connect to your half set always clean the end Make sure it tries and then connect your half set. So always have alcohol preps with you. Okay, so this this was more or less the toys uh, that I used. Now I'm going to talk about the more important aspects um, and the guides that I have with me.